The lawsuit alleges that Tyler essayed a 16-year-old girl decades ago and maintained a long-term relationship with her, which included a planned pregnancy that he then demanded she terminate. What we had done was wrong. It had taken the life of our child and it left the two of us grieving. Stephen, in his own words later in his book, used the words, Jesus, what have I done to describe his feelings after that abortion? I think rock stars, I felt like I had an obligation to keep that alive. I certainly had my way with women, and women had their way with me. an obligation to keep it alive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in this video, we're going to take an in-depth look at the recently filed child sex abuse lawsuit against Aerosmith lead singer Steven Tyler that allegedly took place 50 years ago. When I first read about this story, filed in the final hours before legislation expired, my first thought was, this lady just has her hand out. Did this even really happen? However, once I researched the story and listened to Stephen Tyler's memoir and Julia Holcomb's testimony, I am convinced not only did it happen, but Steven Tyler is guilty, non-remorseful, and needs to pay. So stick around until the end so you can get the whole story on the man Steven Tyler is and hear the story of the woman who is suing him over what she says happened in the 1970s. This was made possible in 2019 when California passed legislation called the California Child's Victim Act that lifted the statute of limitations and granted a three-year look-back period for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to come forward with their allegations. The deadline to file a lawsuit was December the 31st, 2022. Julia Mosley, formerly Julia Holcomb, who is Steven Tyler's former girlfriend from the mid-70s, so 50 years ago, filed a lawsuit for an undisclosed amount of money against him in Los Angeles in the final days of the act on December the 29th, 2022. So two days before the three-year legislation expired. When I first read the article, because of these facts, I didn't really have much belief in the validity of the suit. But after further researching the topic and the situation, I do think she has a valid lawsuit. The suit does not list Steven Tyler by name, but instead lists Doe's 1 through 50, like John Doe. So 50 people total are listed in the lawsuit. The acclaimed Aerosmith frontman, although unnamed in the new lawsuit, is mentioned as one of 50 defendants identified under a Doe. This is actually not the first time that she has spoken out about their relationship. As a matter of fact, she began speaking out about what happened to her in the mid-1970s over 10 years ago when Steven Tyler first published his memoir. But we will get into all of that in more detail later. In order to properly research this video, I listened to all 13 hours of Steven Tyler's memoir, Does the Noise in My Head Bother You? And it was a long 13 hours, all about drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, baby. Take away the drugs and there's more time for... I must say that I don't know much about music, but the man is a musical genius. His father went to school at Juilliard and played classical piano like Mozart, Bach, and all that kind of stuff. And this is what Steven Tyler grew up listening to on the baby grand piano in their living room. My room at this apartment that we all lived in was basically the living room. I mean, everybody just hung out in my room. My room was the only room big enough to put a piano in. So I woke up every morning to Steven playing this weird song in the key of F telling me how much of a hit it was going to be and it turned out to be dream on the story was really hard for me to follow as it didn't follow a linear timeline but jumped all around and some of it was pretty whimsical which is understandable because he lived in a drug-induced haze a lot of if not most of his life i was born at the polyclinic hospital in the bronx march 26 1948 
As soon as I could travel, my parents headed straight out of town to Sunapee, New Hampshire, to the little housekeeping cottages they rented out every summer, kind of old-fashioned bed and breakfast deal, only it was 1950. I was put in a crib at the side of the house. A fox came by and thought I was a cub, grabbed me by the scruff of my diaper, and dragged me into the woods. I grew up with the animals and the children of the woods. Now, with that being said, although he is an, an amazing musical artist, I really don't think very highly of him as a person and definitely not as a man. Monogamy is a strong moral value of mine and is definitely not one of his values. How do you have a meaningful relationship when you have women throwing themselves at you all the time? You cheat. You cheat. You break. You have, you just don't, you're not true. You're not faithful. You might defend him by saying he was a rock star, he did a lot of drugs, but so was his toxic twin, Joe Perry, his self-described brother, soulmate, other half, and he was a totally different man. They built Aerosmith together, wrote the songs together, did drugs together, but I think Joe Perry was a much classier person who was faithful to his wives, even according to Tyler's memoir. We were backstage after the show and the groupies there were famous for being ready for the bands and I was never a groupie guy. I never got got into that. I was always looking for the for the right girl and I found her. Her name's Billy. We've been together 30 years. Steven basically says STDs were rampant. No big deal. Back then, sure, you could have gotten gonorrhea, but with one shot of penicillin, see ya. Unlike today, STDs were a dime store a dozen in those days. How do you avoid them? Screw them through saran wrap? Nah, if they washed, they were clean. As someone once said, you ain't seen nothing till you're down on a muffin. And he had so many crafts that he talked to them, which I think is pretty disgusting. I remember one night on the road when Joe and I were sharing a bed with two girls and woke up in the morning with a seafood blue plate special. Crabs for everybody. And I'm the last guy on the planet to use that little Barbie doll comb that used to come with a bottle of A200 that would burn the critters out. At one point, I had so many crabs, I used to say goodnight to them. Julia and Steven's relationship started in 1973, right after she turned 16 years old. Julia had a rough home life, an absentee father. We had a very difficult family background. My father abandoned my mother when I was just a toddler. I don't remember my father being at home. I remember the first time I saw him, he came to visit and he brought a puppy with him and he spent the day. And it was like heaven that day that daddy was there and I was thrilled. But at the end of the day, he said he had to go buy a pack of cigarettes and he didn't come home. I don't remember how long it was before I saw him again. An alcoholic stepfather, an older sister who had recently left home, and ever since her younger brother died in a car wreck a couple of years before that, her mom was never the same. Our life became very unsupervised, and I felt that I almost didn't have a place where I belonged anymore. I was in the way at home. When Julia was 15, she met a 24-year-old woman who frequently went to rock concerts with backstage passes. But at that time, it was illegal for Julia to attend as she had to be 16. As soon as she turned 16, she attended the Aerosmith concert in Portland, Oregon. The woman quickly taught Julia to dress in revealing clothing to get noticed and use sex as a hook to try to catch a rock star. According to Steven Tyler's memoir, he met Julia with a group called the Little Oral Annie Club. Steven describes this group as being a bunch of young groupies who attended various rock concerts to have sex with the band. They were led by a lady named Strawberry Fields, who he basically described as a madam. She had costumes made for all the girls. My, 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 what do I spy with my little eye? Six nubile young chicks, one cuter than the next. They curtsy and introduce themselves to the band. One says, 
Hello, boys. We're the little Oral Annie Club. Well, beam me up, Scotty, says I. Then she says, Well, sir, we've taught each other how to give great heads, so when we meet rock stars, we blow you like no man has been blown before. All these girls were dressed up fantasy style in sexy costumes. Guys are very predictable creatures. We all like schoolgirls in plaid skirts, women in high heels, and fishnet stockings. Strawberry Fields, as she called herself, was their den mother. Kind of heavy set and a little older, but she knew what rock stars, hell, what all boys wanted. As for the me that I thought I knew, he left the building. This woman knew. She knew how to take care of her girls and how to please the boys. The girls are parading around in their outfits, and I'm talking to Strawberry Field. She's got my attention, and other parts of my anatomy too by now, and she's telling me all the stuff they do. Groupy geishas. So, uh, you girls, you dress up in different outfits? I asked. Well, of course, we have any kind of costume you want, chimes Ms. Fields. Just tell me, we're here to please. This was way before you could call a service and say, send over a couple of hookers dressed up like Jack Sparrow and Whoopi Goldberg. Strawberry Field had the costumes made to order for your particular perverted fantasy, any fantasy your twisted little heart desired. And Julia was dressed up as Little Bo Peep. Stephen, according to the suit, took Julia back to his hotel room where they discussed her age. She was 16 and he was 25. Penny Lane, the groupie Kate Hudson played in Almost Famous, could easily have been based on sweet, hell, I'm not even gonna give the girl a pseudonym, but that was her, my girlfriend-to-be, one of the six girls in the Little Oral Annie Club we met that night. She was 16, she knew how to nasty, and there wasn't a hair on it. With my bad self being 26 and she barely old enough to drive and sexy as hell, I just fell madly in love with her. She was a cute, skinny little tomboy dressed up as Little Bo Peep. She was my heart's desire, my partner in crimes of passion. After he allegedly asked why she was out all night by herself, Stephen and Julia talked about her troubles at home. He then performed various acts of criminal sexual conduct upon her before sending her home in a taxi the next morning, according to the lawsuit. The lawsuit accuses Steven Tyler of sexual assault, sexual battery, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Steven also allegedly bought Julia her own plane ticket to his next Aerosmith show in Seattle since she was a minor and could not legally travel with him across state lines. After the Seattle show, Steven Tyler allegedly performed more sexual acts on her and Julia flew back to Portland the next morning. No one asked where I was at my, my home. I, my supervision was just not there. My mother allowed me to travel with him and within a few months, I was moved to Boston and living with Stephen. By 1974, as the suit alleges, Stephen convinced Julia's mother to allow him to become her guardian, which would allow him to more easily travel with her across state lines without criminal prosecution. This timeline listed in the lawsuit matches Stephen Tyler's own comments from his 2011 memoir. I went and slept at her parents' house for a couple of nights and her parents fell in love with me, signed papers over for me to have custody so I wouldn't get arrested if I took her out of state. I took her on tour with me. Stephen allegedly told Julia's mother he would provide better support than she was getting at home, promising to enroll her in school and give her medical care. However, according to the lawsuit, Stephen Tyler did not meaningfully follow through on those promises and instead continued to travel with, assault, and provide alcohol and drugs to the plaintiff. When Stephen first suggested this, Julia did not believe her mother would sign over guardianship to Stephen and was surprised when Stephen informed her that she had signed the papers. Julia, who was already abandoned by her father, felt abandoned by her mother and her stepfather as well. So I was barely 16. He wanted to take me on tour with him and mm -hmm. he told me that it was illegal for me to cross state lines unless he was my guardian and I was his ward. I didn't think my mother would sign the papers. Um, 
But he came to me very shortly after that, and he had the paper signed. And I remember almost being devastated. I felt kind of abandoned. I wasn't sure what it meant because I knew we weren't married, but I was... Uh, he was like a parent to me, and yet we were in a relationship together. I asked him, how did you get her to sign those papers? And he said, I told her that I needed them for you to go to school. And, you know, I didn't go to school. I toured with him. Stephen was all she had, and she was officially his ward, his property. I didn't realize that I would be taking a path that would take me to the brink of death, and that I would be lucky to survive and that I would have um, it end in tragedy. Julia further alleges that she was pregnant with Stephen's son in 1975 when she was 17 years old, but got an abortion after Stephen insisted she terminate the pregnancy following an apartment fire. She claims that the pregnancy was not unwanted or unplanned by either party. He began speaking with me about having a child, and I thought that was wonderful. I. I was convinced in my mind that he must truly love me if he wanted to have a baby with me. Actually, she was on birth control pills originally. When Stephen told her that he wanted to start a family and asked her to have his baby, she said yes and he threw her birth control pills off the balcony or off the window or whatever of their hotel room. After she got pregnant, both Julia and Stephen were so excited. He proposed, she said yes. After I became pregnant, he told me that we would marry and he said that we needed to marry because of um, I was his ward and I had become pregnant. And he took her to New Hampshire to tell his parents. I almost took a teen bride. Stephen's mother was supportive, but his father had reservations because of her age and immaturity. His grandmother, though, refused to give them her ring for the wedding for fear it would leave the family if they divorced. I'm not sure everything that, that was discussed, but I could tell that that his, uh, his discussions with them didn't go like he had hoped. And this is where their relationship began to fall apart, and the wedding was called off. That night was very difficult. I remember leaving the house with Stephen, and we argued over a ring. I remember telling him that we should just go and get a ring at a store and get married, and things would be fine. And he had had a change of heart, and I could see that that wasn't going to happen. We were just kind of in limbo. Afterwards, Stephen left Julia at their apartment in Boston as he went on tour. He called every day for two weeks to check on her. Julia, five months pregnant with no education, no license, no car, no job, no prenatal care, and no money, informed Stephen that she was getting low on food and needed some groceries. So he told her the next day that he was seeing Ray Tabano, a childhood friend of his and an original band member, to take her to the store and buy her some groceries. He left me to travel on the road and there was just a little bit of food in the house after he would call every day and he would just check on me see how I was doing and after the food ran low I remember telling him I needed to go grocery shopping and he told me he would send a, a friend that had worked for the band and had one time been a band member, Ray Tobano, would come to the house and take me grocery shopping the next day. She was super excited to be leaving the apartment as she hadn't left in a couple of weeks. She got up that morning and got ready. She remembers Ray coming up the walkway and letting him in. And that's the last thing that she remembers. She woke up on the couch, locked in the apartment with the apartment on fire. When I first heard this, I thought she all but states that Ray started that fire. I hadn't been out of that apartment in weeks, so I was excited. And I, there was a little window that was looking over the street. And I remember waking up early, getting ready, and sitting by the window waiting for Ray to come. And I, I remember watching him walk up the stairs. And I remember letting him into the apartment. And I don't remember perfectly, with perfect clarity, everything that happened. But I did wake up in a fire. We did not go grocery shopping. I don't know. Ray was gone when I woke up, and the apartment was filled with smoke. I was laying on a sofa, and I was choking. I could hardly breathe. There was so much smoke. I couldn't see anything in the room but smoke. I stood up, and I tripped over 
a table that was in front of the, the couch and I fell on the floor. And on the floor, there was more air. It was down low and I could breathe. She recalled a commercial by Bill Cosby back in the 70s that told how to survive a fire. She got low on the ground and went to the front door and all the multiple locks on the door were locked, which I think is super suspicious. I made the decision uh, to kind of run crawling on the floor to uh, the front door. And when I got there, it was locked. There were several bolts on the doors and now, now you would normally open that door right there i was, had opened it to let ray in there was the a apartment. key lock a deadbolt and then there was also a bar lock that would normally just slide out of the way stephen had a lot of locks on the apartment because he had kept drugs in that apartment and he wanted to have an opportunity to have the door open slowly if somebody like the police came and so there were a lot of locks on that door and the bar lock wouldn't move. I couldn't get it to budge. I... She couldn't get the security bar open and the fire was raging up the stairs. So she crawled into their master bedroom where there was a fireplace that they had never used. She made sure the flue was open so she could get some air and crawled into it and passed out. Thankfully, the firefighters found her and rescued her. Well, a very brave fireman pulled me out of that fireplace and I was near death. I th um, I've read that they had to revive me. I woke up in a hospital and I was okay. The doctors had thought that if I survived, I would be brain damaged because I had had so much smoke inhalation. But I was fine. I was able to answer the questions. She is unsure how much time had passed, but Stephen was there. And she woke up to the most unfortunate news ever. The man she loved, the man she was supposed to marry, the man she wanted to start a family with, wanted her to have an abortion. That day. As more time went by, I began to strengthen. And I was allowed to, uh, I was told that I would be able to go home. But before I could get out of that hospital, Stephen came to me and told me that I was going to have an abortion. And I had never considered having an abortion. It was something that I was, I just never dreamed of having an abortion. I wanted my baby with all my heart. At first, she refused, but he sat there in the hospital with her, snorting coke and insisting, making her choose between him and the baby. I knew that I wanted my baby and I was not willing to have an abortion. I told him no. And we began to argue. He had lawyers there at the hospital. He had... So are you in a hospital bed at the time? I was still in the hospital. I was still just barely recovered from the fire. This was her guardian, the only person she had to care for her. She was still underage, no education, no license, and she had no means of supporting herself and her baby. When a woman finds herself an expectant mother, she has to be put in a position frequently where she has to defend her right to have her child and to become a mother. And that's the position I was in. Stephen did not want me to have the baby and he knew that it was now or never and he was going, he, he used all of his power and wealth to bring about that abortion. And we argued about it for hours. I told him no. In, in the hospital? In the hospital, yeah. in the end, the decision was either I could have that abortion or I could hit the street. You know, maybe my mother would take me back. I didn't know. I, at that point, I was terrified. I just gave in out of fear and desperation. I didn't know what would happen to me, and I didn't know how I would take care of a baby. I had no, I had no prospects. I felt like I had no power. In making the argument for abortion, he claimed the baby had been harmed by smoke inhalation and lack of oxygen to the baby. But the lawsuit claims a medical professional told her the unborn baby was not harmed by the fire. The doctor who was taking care of me, he told me that my lungs were remarkably clear and that he was surprised um, that I was in the state of health that I was. Mm -hmm. I asked him how my baby was and he told me the baby's heartbeat sounded good and that it was fine and that I should be okay. Mm -hmm. And so he was a very kind and comforting doctor. Mm -hmm. 
Finally, feeling she had no other choice, she agreed to the abortion. Stephen brought in another doctor to perform the procedure, and it was not performed by the doctor who had been caring for her after the fire. <sighs> he had another doctor who was there and was had told me that he said that this other doctor was going to perform the abortion, that the doctor who had seen me before was not going to do it, but he had a different doctor to do the abortion. And that was where the worst nightmare began because that abortion was a late-term saline abortion. And it was just a nightmare. Nobody explained to her what was going to happen. I wasn't really told what to expect. I was taken into this room. I was naked. Stephen was there. There was the doctor was beside me. I didn't I didn't see what he was holding in his hand, but he told me, hold very still, or you could be killed or injured. And I remember just freezing in fear and thinking, what did what does he mean? And before I could even ask him the words what he meant, he had taken a large needle and stabbed my uterus with it and punctured my uterus. And I remember just gasping in shock and disbelief and they began injecting saline into my uterus. I was told it's not a baby, it's a fetus. It's uh it's and they told me immediately after they had punctured my uterus that they had that my baby was no longer living and that they would move me to another part of the hospital and that the baby's uh that the fetus would be delivered. I was in labor for many hours and when the baby began to be delivered, they put me under. They gave me a shot, and I uh, went to sleep. And I woke up, and it was over. But I felt just like something inside of me had died after that abortion. I, I didn't recover very quickly emotionally or um, I was just grieving inside. And she later found out that her baby, a boy, was born alive and Stephen knew it. And they killed her baby. He began to speak to me about the abortion. And um, I think he wanted to kind of get it off of his chest. And that is when he told me that the baby had been born alive and that it, it had either been allowed to die. He didn't finish his sentence because as soon as he started saying it had been born alive, I reacted to his words by crying and asking him how could that be true, how could it be born alive, and and if it was born alive, how could they not help it? How could it not have been offered aid? And he realized at that point that he had said too much and that he began to try to comfort me with the words, um, that I shouldn't think about it anymore, that it couldn't be changed at this point, it was over and done with, and that his words, they still haunt me. It, he said, we did the right thing. She states, as a couple, they could never get over killing their child. Stephen's struggles with it has also discussed in the book, Walk This Way. But in his memoir, 15 years later, he doesn't mention the abortion although he does mention the house fire. So in the band's oral autobiography, Walk This Way, Julia is discussed, but she's given the pseudonym Diana Hall. And this is what Ray has to say about that day. Diana was too young. When he went on the road, he'd say, Ray, make sure you keep an eye on her. I went over one day to dole a little coke out to her, and a half hour later, I get a call that the street is full of fire engines. I told Stephen to get rid of her after she burned his elf house down. But she was pregnant and he still wanted to be with her. Steven, if she has this elfin baby, you're going to be stuck with this girl for life. Come on, man. Do the smart thing. So they had an abortion. And it really messed Steven up because it was a boy. He was there. He saw the whole thing. And it elfed him up big time. Afterwards, I'm really unsure of the time span, but she left Steven and went back to Portland to change her life. You know, our relationship was altered after that abortion, but I didn't go home right away. Um, it was within about a year I returned home. I could not sleep at night. I would wake up dreaming of the fire and of that abortion. She became a devout Catholic, met her husband, birthed seven kids, and buried her previous experiences with Steven Tyler until he wrote about them in his memoir. 
Actually, she said that she never discussed what happened to her for 36 years, and her kids had no idea about her previous life until her oldest son read an article about her and Stephen and recognized her accompanying picture in the magazine. It was not something I ever expected to speak about in a public way. I had been silent about it throughout my married life. I have six beautiful sons and a daughter, and I had never told my children about my relationship with Stephen or my abortion. It was something that had caused me a great deal of grief, and I didn't want them to carry that same burden. So I had remained silent. Stephen made it public in his book, his first book that he wrote, but he left my name out, so I felt like I didn't have to answer it. In his second book, when he became an American Idol judge, he mentioned me. And after that, Star Magazine wrote an article where they mentioned my name and they used a photograph of me. And my oldest son saw it, read the article and recognized his mother. It was at this point that she became silent no more. So around 2011, she began speaking out about her experience and the child exploitation that occurs in the music industry while people knowingly look away. Julia says in the suit that her life was further disrupted with the publication of Stephen's memoir which, without her consent, referenced his time with an underage girl and subjected her to involuntary infamy while framing the alleged abuse as a romantic, loving relationship. As I stated earlier, Stephen Tyler has also spoken of a relationship with an underage girl, both in his own memoir and in Aerosmith's autobiography. The Aerosmith autobiography references the relationship, the apartment fire, and abortion, but Tyler refers to the girl as Diana Hall and said she was 14 at the time they met. In his memoir, however, he says she was 16 and he writes about the fire but not the abortion. In the lawsuit, Julia says she's mentioned in the memoir's acknowledgments, which further removed her anonymity. 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 In the lawsuit, Julia says she's mentioned in the memoir's acknowledgments, which further removed her anonymity. Anonymity. Sorry, I'm struggling there. The book's acknowledgments include Julia Halcombe, which is a mere misspelling of her last name. Personally, I think Steven Tyler has a very vague memory due to his drug use and doesn't know what he did with who. I thought people would say, well, you know, didn't you have this sex and that sex and weren't you there and this? Yeah, I did. I had a lot. I had lots of... Remember, I'm from the 70s. It was group sex. You got group ropes. We had lots of sex. I think he likes the idea of being married and having a family, but he never actually intended to because he has a problem with settling down. He said himself, cheat, 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 except for a few days before you return home so you have something to shoot, if you know what I mean. It's sick and it's sad. The whole timeline of events is kind of skewed as it happened 50 years ago, but in the Walk This Way book, it talks about a Playboy model he was also seeing after the abortion while he was still with Julia. She even talks about Diana calling Stephen and she was all suicidal and the effect that the abortion had on her and him. And this was B.B. Buell, the mother of his oldest daughter, Liv Tyler. And this is what B.B. Buell had to say in the book, Walk This Way. She starts by describing her relationship with Stephen Tyler and how they met. She talks about her boyfriend at the time, Todd, and how they always cheated on each other. So this is what she says about Diana. Then we flew to Boston and went to Stephen's carriage house in Brookline. Diana was there, although she wasn't supposed to be, and she and Stephen fought all night and then she left. Stephen and I dove right into this deep sexual trance, and this is when I got pregnant. It was late September 1976. Back in New York, I told Todd that I was going on Aerosmith's European tour with Stephen. He looked at me, shook his head, and said, don't come home. Then back to Boston and many suicidal calls from poor Diana as they were breaking up. It was actually a pretty sad time. The following day, we left for London. He also talks about his first wife, Sorinda Fox. He says they were together for 12 years and divorced in 1987. 
I was married to Sorinda for 12 years. It's a long time, although we probably only spent three and a half to four years physically together. I was living in New York. Sorinda stayed up in Sunapee. When she came to New York with Mia, I'd have Teresa hide behind the refrigerator and stuff like that. Things were very bad between us. I was trying to get sober. She was still getting high. Our divorce became final in September 1987. Which would mean they first got together in 1975. Sorinda and I got married on September 1st, 1978 at the summit of Tro Hill in Sunapee after dating for a year. Therefore, in 76, he was with Bibi, Sorinda, and Julia as this Rolling Stone article from 1976 lists Julia Holcomb by name. And Liv was born in 1977. All of these women were his lovers. All of them got pregnant with his kids, but only one of them was underage and forced to have an abortion. Julia says the reason she thinks he never got her prenatal care because she was five months pregnant and never saw an OBGYN is because she was underage, his ward, and he was scared there would be questions. He never received any prenatal care. Stephen hadn't allowed me to have a uh, pediatrician, I mean a doctor, uh, OB an OBGYN, a gynecologist look at me because um, I was his ward and I was pregnant. He didn't want me to answer questions. If I was him, I would be scared too because it's very twisted and highly illegal. The lawsuit isn't the first time Julia has shared these details about her experience with Steven Tyler. Prior to the complaint, she detailed many of the same allegations in 2011 for the far-right anti-abortion website LifeSite News. And she has gone on programs like Tucker Carlson's to share her experience against pro-choice advocacy. Understandably, she is pro-life. Holcomb also spoke of the experience in the 2021 documentary, a British documentary called Look Away, which focused on sexual abuse and rock music culture. I tried to watch the Look Away documentary, but it's shut down in America, which is really strange. Why? Wow. I even tried installing a VPN to access it and it still wouldn't work even though I was able to subscribe to the BBC and I got notifications from Amazon that I was logging in in England. So the musicians are still being protected and people are still being silenced on a national platform. Courtney Love has some interesting things to say in a tweet about the situation too. Namely, she knew of a 14-year-old that Steven Tyler had groomed, but she had died of a heroin overdose. I never found any records of this or anything, just this video of her tweet where she also references the Look Away movie. In her Instagram post, Courtney Love talked about the documentary Look Away, which is about the groupies who were used and abused by famous rock stars. Courtney Love's Instagram post read, I was around and a victim, and I can attest that every word of this is true. Lori Maddox lost her virginity at age 11. She doesn't say to whom, he's beloved, so Google it. I knew another girl that Steven Tyler also adopted as his ward from her mom at 13. She did not make it and overdosed on smack. She worked the seventh veil with me. But I do find it interesting, especially since he was bragging about being with a 14-year-old in his Aerosmith book when he was almost 30. Maybe there were two underage girls and he has them twisted in his head. I don't really know. But after listening to Steven Tyler's book and researching the lawsuit, I am truly disgusted by Steven Tyler. He has absolutely no remorse for what he has done and is bragging about it when he's in his 60s and thanking his victim and his acknowledgments in the book. After Julia started speaking out about it over a decade ago, he has never sued her or tried to silence her. He has never tried to deny any of her allegations while she is out there telling her side of the story and trying to set his record straight. I 100% believe her. If he had never bragged about it or wrote about it and mentioned her freaking name in his memoir, she would have never said a word. As she says, the mention of her in the book re-traumatized her all over again. And I totally get that. 
So yeah, even though when I first read that he was being sued over something that happened 50 years ago and rolled my eyes thinking it was just some woman with her hand out, I have totally changed my mind and I hope she wins. Let me know what y'all think. If you like this video, check out this last video I did about child abuse and child sex abuse that occurred allegedly for 12 years at this children's hospital. Multiple allegations were made to various state agencies and were ruled unfounded, even though people were later arrested and prosecuted for the crimes. 14 years after it started and five years into an active police investigation, police finally arrested the former medical director of the facility in December of 2022 after arresting several other employees of the hospital. As a nation, we have got to do better to protect our children. Y'all come back now. You hear? Thanks for watching. Bye.